Welcome to Hawthorne University's award-winning Holistic Health and Nutrition webinar series, and I really want to thank you for attending today's presentation with Chris Masterjohn, PhD, on methylation, MTHFR, and histamine. I'm just certain we're going to receive some terrific information from Chris today, so this presentation is being recorded, and it'll be available for replay on our website in just a few days. We'll also have time for question and answer period at the end of the presentation. So please write your questions or comments into the webinar question panel at any time, and I'll present them for you when we're in Q&A. I'm your host, Paula Bartholomew, one of the founders of Hawthorne. So let's get started with an intro to today's topic and our presenter. Methylation is a process vital to both mental and physical health. It has many roles, but most powerfully affects phosphatidylcholine, which is needed for liver and gallbladder health, for creatine, needed for strength and muscularity. For dopamine, important to movement and motivation. For histamine, important to anxiety, alertness, digestive health, and symptoms of allergies. And for many less appreciated roles in mental health, digestion, skin health, and more that we'll learn about here in this presentation. After this pre lecture, I'm sure that we should be able to identify the most important purposes of the methylation pathway, identify the vitamins and minerals used by the pathway, recognize signs and symptoms that could be impacted by methylation, and develop nutritional strategies to help people with methylation-related signs and symptoms. Chris Masterjohn earned his PhD in nutritional sciences from the University of Connecticut in the summer of 2012. He served as a postdoctoral research associate in the comparative biosciences department of the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Illinois, and also served as assistant professor of health and nutrition sciences at Brooklyn College, which is part of City University of New York. Now Chris works on his own, conducting independent research, consulting, working on information products, collaborating on information and technology products, and producing tons of free content to help people gain better health. He has deep and personal experiences with the power of food, movement, and mindfulness to support health and well-being. He wants to take what he's learned and pay it forward, and here he is with us today at Hawthorne. So please join us in his pursuit of truth, learning, and wonder. I love it, Chris. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Paula, very much for that introduction. All right, so um, at a 30,000-foot view, methylation is a, an important process that supports mental and physical health using a number of nutrients, especially the B vitamins, folate, vitamin B9, vitamin B12, and the B vitamin-like compound choline, uh, and then also in assistance a number of minerals and a number of other B vitamins. If we... Uh, if we get down to like a 10,000-foot view instead of a 30,000-foot view, we could say uh, a, a little bit more about the chemical detail, which I think is important because nutrients are molecules. And so if we understand some of the basic science in terms of the chemistry and the biochemistry, that will help us better understand the roles that nutrients are playing and what we can do with nutrition to support this pathway. So a methyl group chemically is a single carbon atom and it's the simplest way that you could add a single carbon atom to another molecule. So you can see on the screen here that um, the methyl group is CH3, that C is carbon, and H3 means there's three hydrogens attached to it. In reality, you would never find this methyl group on its own, you would always find it attached to something. And the hydrogen is basically a way of just filling up all the extra binding sites. So all carbons bind to four, ad four other atoms. If this methyl group is bound to another to some molecule over here, then these three hydrogens are going to be occupying the three other binding sites. That first binding site is is binding it to the molecule itself. So to have these three hydrogens that that way is is basically just to fill up all the other spaces. So really the significance of this in total is this is the simplest single carbon atom that you could put in a molecule. And in fact, the methylation system is often called one carbon metabolism because it is the process of transferring around single carbon atoms. And uh, if you think of life as life, biology is all 
made up of organic, meaning carbon-containing compounds, then you can imagine that methyl groups would be really important as single carbon atoms to producing and regulating molecules. So if you think of, um, you know, think of any imaginary carbon-containing molecule, it's going to be composed of lots and lots of carbons. So most of those carbons are going to be put together using two carbon units called acetyl groups. But what if you're putting together a molecule that requires an odd number of carbons? You would have to add or subtract a single carbon atom. That would be a methyl group. That would be methylation or demethylation. If you wanted to produce a molecule that was made of maybe some giant structure made of an even number of carbons, but then also you had uh, some other carbon that comes branching off of it that had a single carbon and then something else, maybe nitrogen or oxygen or sulfur or whatever, you might have to build that sing single carbon bridge with a single carbon atom, a methyl group. Similarly, if you want to regulate any of the molecules in the body, you're going to have to change their structure in some way. And there are many ways to change the structure of something, but one of those ways is to add or take away a single carbon atom. That would be methylation or demethylation. And so in sum, this methyl group is absolutely central to the synthesis of many molecules, and it is added or taken away from many molecules as a form of regulation. Now, if we look at what do we do with methylation, even though there's hundreds of different things that are impacted by methylation, the overwhelming bulk of this is used for very few things. So 90% of methylation is used for just synthesizing two molecules. The first one is creatine. That's about 45% of the methylation demand. And the other is phosphatidylcholine, which is another 45% of the methylation demand. So just these two right here are 90% of methylation. That other 10% as described here is spread across dozens of reactions, including the breakdown of dopamine and histamine, regulation of other neurotransmitters, and the regulation of gene expression. Now, we prioritize what we do with methylation so that some things are really sensitive to the supply of methyl groups and some things are not. And if you think about this, you know, imagine that maybe three times a day you're eating a meal. Every time you eat that meal, you're eating the amino acid methionine in the protein that you eat, and that methionine is the major methyl donor. You are eating folate and B12 and choline, which help recycle that methionine to act as the major methyl donor. And then there are other things in the food that might supply methyl groups as well. So your immediate supply of methyl groups goes way up when you eat a meal, and then five hours later, when you're in the fasting state and you haven't eaten another meal, your supply of methyl groups is way, 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 way down. So one of the things that you absolutely don't want to happen is you don't want all the things that can be methylated to be equally impacted by the supply of methyl groups. And so what you find is this prioritization where at the very, very bottom, phosphatidylcholine tends to be very, very stable and gene expression tends to be very, very stable. And the reason is that, um, particularly for gene expression, you have thousands of genes that you're regulating, and you have to regulate those genes for a specific purpose. So for example, maybe there's a cancer-promoting gene that you want always to be suppressed. Maybe there's a cancer-protective uh, gene that you want always to be expressed, not suppressed. Maybe there are things that you want to, in general, res respond to long-term changes in the diet. For example, if you're eating a very carbohydrate-heavy diet all the time, you're going to highly express genes involved in using carbohydrate, and you're going to suppress genes that are involved in using fat. If you eat a fat-dominant diet and a, car a low-carb diet, you're going to do the opposite. You're going to specialize in burning fat. So you want, you know, maybe these things take weeks to change, and you don't want gene expression to go, you, you don't want, for example, if you're on a high fat diet, you don't want a gene that's used um, in burning carbohydrate to all of a sudden be way expressed just because you were fasting five hours and you didn't have enough methyl groups to regulate that gene. It just doesn't make any sense. 
your gene expression uses methyl groups, but it is not that sensitive to the supply of methyl groups because it's controlling the expression of genes for other purposes that have nothing to do with the supply of methyl groups. On the very opposite end, we have creatine here. Creatine synthesis is the single most sensitive thing to methylation, and the reason is as follows. You, on average, have about 120 grams of creatine in your body, and that creatine is used, uh, you know, 90% of it is in your muscles where it's supporting muscular strength and to some degree is supporting muscle, muscle volume as well, keeping your lean body mass on. And then 10% of creatine is distributed elsewhere where it's super important to brain function in the brain. It's very important to digestion in the stomach. It's very important to a lot to fertility because it supplies the energy that sperm use to swim up the vaginal canal to, to fertilize an egg. It's very important to the energy metabolism of the skin. So wound healing and skin health are very dependent on creatine. Um, this creatine, you because you have 120 grams of creatine in your body, um, you lose about two grams of creatine a day by having it spontaneously degrade into creatinine, which is lost in the urine. In fact, if you get test results that are from a urinalysis, oftentimes it will be expressed as something per milligram or per gram of creatinine. And that's because there's this relatively constant spillage of two grams of creatine that gets lost as creatinine in your urine every day. And uh, all you care about on a day-to-day -day basis, like imagine that you didn't synthesize any creatine today in the worst case scenario. What would happen? Well, tomorrow, instead of having 120 grams of creatine in your body, you'd have 118 grams of creatine in your body. Not that big of a deal. This is gonna be a huge deal if you never synthesize creatine again, because in five days, you're gonna have 110 grams. In, t in 10 days, you're gonna have 100 grams, and that creatine supply is gonna get decimated very, very quickly. But you know, imagine that today, you didn't synthesize any creatine, then tomorrow you synthesized four grams. Well, the next day, you're going to be right back where you started, 120 grams. Everything evens out as long as, on average, you make two grams of creatine a day. So creatine is a very convenient thing to ramp up or down depending on the supply of methyl groups. You eat a meal, you have an influx of methionine, you have an influx of folate, B12, choline. You have a huge supply of methyl groups. All of a sudden, you're, you have an excess. What are you going to do with it? You're going to synthesize a lot of creatine. Four to five hours later, you've You've now, you're now essentially in the fasting state. You don't have a big supply of methyl groups. You're not gonna compromise all the other things that are important in your body. You're just gonna synthesize less creatine because you know that the next time you eat, you can make up for it. So what we find is that in the fasting feeding cycle, because the supply of methyl groups goes up and down, the supply of creatine goes up and down. And that conserves methyl groups to be more stable for these other processes. Now. Neurotransmitters such as dopamine and histamine are not as stable as gene expression. They're not as stable as phosphatidylcholine, which is essential for structural purposes in, in cell membrane health and is also uh, essential for bile acid flow and uh, the export of triglycerides from the liver. Um, these things are super stable. Creatine is very sensitive. Histamine and dopamine are kind of in between. So dopamine, which is a very important motivation and value assessing chemical, is is less sensitive to, than creatine is, but, but it is very sensitive. Histamine is a little bit less sensitive than dopamine. Histamine is very important in the brain for alertness. Too much of it causes anxiety. Um, and then in the stomach, it's supporting stomach acid production, which is important to digestion. And in the, in the rest of the body, it, it's uh, creating what we associate, you know, the, the symptoms we associate with allergic reactions. Um, so these things in the middle, if everything is well-nourished, they shouldn't go up and down with the supply of methyl groups. But if everything is not well-nourished, then that's when you can start to get variations in these. In other words, the healthiest person who has optimal nourishing for everything should really only see creatine going up and down with a meal. These other things should be very stably regulated according to you know, according to the brain's assessment of value for dopamine, according to the need for stomach acid or the need for wakefulness and alertness in the brain, 
these things according to whatever you would regulate these thousands of genes. So it's as nutritional supply starts, the quality of the nutrition and the appropriate individualization of the nutrition to that, that individual's needs, as that declines, that's when dopamine and histamine start becoming sensitive to the supply of methyl groups. You would need extreme malnourishment to get to the point where gene expression is going to be affected. Phosphatidylcholine, we'll talk about later. It does it get impacted by nutrition, um, but to understand why, it, despite being very insensitive to supply of methyl groups, will require some nuance I'll address at the end. All right, so let's get into a little more detail. The universal methyl donor is acidenazylmethionine. We take the amino acid methionine from the protein that we eat and we activate it by adding adenosine to it. And that adenosine comes from ATP. ATP, the A stands for adenosine, the TP stands for triphosphate. There's two phosphate matched up with this adenosine and there's energy stored in those phosphate bonds. Magnesium is universally used as uh, to stabilize the ATP molecule. And every single instance where you see ATP being utilized in biochemistry, that implies the use of magnesium. So we, and you can imagine this ATP is gonna be impacted by you know, your caloric balance. So if you're fasting, you have less ATP. If you're in the fed state, you have more ATP because you're getting energy from the food you eat. It's also gonna be impacted by the B vitamins that are used to synthesize ATP by thyroid hormone, which increases the metabolic rate and therefore increases ATP production by insulin and insulin sensitivity, which is needed to deliver energy into cells so that you can use that energy to make ATP and so on. And then magnesium is gonna be impacted by your magnesium status. And then there's an, an enzyme, methionine adenosyl transferase, that takes the energy in the phosphate bonds and takes the adenosine, adds it to methionine, and makes acidenosylmethionine. Acidenosylmethionine, often called, often abbreviated uh, capital S, capital A, capital M, little e, or sort of SAME, people call it in the supplement world. Um, in biochemistry, usually people call it SAM for S adenosylmethionine. Acidenosylmethionine now can methylate uh, hundreds of different things. And so, as a general pattern, what you're doing is you're methylating some methyl acceptor that's becoming a methylated product. And it's this that varies in all the different biochemical pathways. The universal thing is that acidenosylmethionine was the methyl donor. And in the process of donating that methyl group, it became acidenosyl homocysteine. You then hydrolyze acidenosyl homocysteine to free up the adenosine so you can use it to remake uh, ATP or break it down. And then you get homocysteine. And the enzyme involved in hydrolyzing acidenosyl homocysteine is acidenosyl homocysteine hydrolase. Now, once you have homocysteine, you can't do this again unless you have another methionine mo molecule. In the fed state, you have protein, which contains methionine. You have an influx of new methionine where you can get another methionine molecule. But in the fasting state, the supply of methionine is going to be low. So you're going to have to recycle this homocysteine back to methionine. The way you do that is what's on this slide. So everything that we're looking at the, on, on the right is everything that we took from right here. So that's just being repeated. What we're adding is the way that we go back from homocysteine to methionine. And there are two separate, um, there are two separate ways we can do that. In general, uh, the top pathway, which uses folate and vitamin B12, is, is about 50%. And then the pathway that uses choline and betaine on the bottom is about 50%. But that can vary according to number one, your genetics. We'll talk a little bit later about things that can compromise the use of these. And then it can also vary according to the supply of your nutrients. Because if you eat, you know, if you're, if you're deficient in folate and you have plenty of choline, you're gonna use the choline pathway more. And if you're deficient in choline and you have plenty of folate and B12, you're going to use the folate and B12 pathway more. But the average person, it's about 50-50. Now, it's not 50-50 in every tissue. So some tissues are very effective at using both. Some are much more dependent on using one or the other. In general, the, the folate and B12 pathway is more universal. Um, but 
you know, everything kind of evens out, right? So there might be some tissue that, that can only use folate and B12 for the most part, but that doesn't stop the fact that you could compensate for folate and B12 deficiencies to at least some degree by eating more choline, because what you'll do is you'll conserve the folate and B12 for the tissue that is more dependent on it, and you'll use the choline to substitute for the use of folate and B12 in the tissues that are able to make that substitution. So if we look at each of these pathways, uh, folate is gonna take a methyl group from amino acid metabolism. And here, amino acid metabolism just condensing much more complicated biochemistry that I'm not going into right now. So you take that methyl group from an amino acid and you get methylfolate. I'm simplifying this. It's really, uh, it, it, it's, it's actually a multi-step process to synthesize methylfolate. And actually this is, you know, 5-L-methyl tetrahydrofolate, but I'm simplifying the terminology here. So um, the enzyme that adds the folate group to, to make methylfolate, or actually the last enzyme in that, in that pathway, is MTHFR, 5-10-methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. And then once you have methylfolate, you can pass that methyl group on to B12 to become methyl B12. That's technically, that's methylcobalamin. And then B12 takes that methyl group and adds it to homocysteine to become methionine. And the enzyme that catalyzes the last two reactions, so the passing of the methyl group from folate to B12 to homocysteine to make methionine is methionine synthase. And these abbreviations are shown down here in the bottom. On the other hand, the second system takes phosphatidylcholine, converts it to choline, converts the choline to betaine, and uses betaine as the methyl donor to convert homocysteine to methionine. That uses the enzyme betaine homocysteine methyltransferase, or BHMT. And when betaine loses that methyl group, it becomes dimethylglycine. That dimethylglycine then can go into the mit So most of this is happening in the cytosol, which is the general compartment of the cell where all the organelles are in. in. It's sort of like if you had a house with a bunch of different rooms. The cytosol is kind of the hallway. It's like... All, if all the organelles are different rooms, the cytosol is kind of like the, the hallway that connects all the different rooms. So the cytosol is where most, most of this methylation stuff is happening. Um, but then a lot, of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of assistive roles occur in the mitochondria. And if betaine gives up the methyl group to become dimethylglycine, that dimethylglycine is going to go back to the mitochondria and be recycled there. Uh, now, we can also eat betaine in the diet. Generally, choline is much more widely distributed in foods than betaine is, but you can eat betaine. It does occur naturally in foods, and you can take both of these as a supplement. Betaine as a supplement is called trimethylglycine or TMG. Um, so summarizing everything on the last slide on the left, B12 and folate can be used to supply methyl groups Choline and betaine can be used to supply methyl groups. These are alternative ways of supplying the same methyl group to the same process. Uh, these are shown in green because they're pro-methyl group. On the flip side, we have to have a way to buffer excess methyl groups, and that's especially the case um, in the fed state, because in the fed state, again, we have a bunch of methionine coming in from the protein that we're eating. So we have all these extra methyl groups, and we don't want to over-methylate things. You know, it's not a big deal if we synthesize excess creatine because actually we want creatine to go up in the fed state and down in the fasting state. But it is a big deal if all of a sudden, because we ate a steak, all of a sudden we're methylating twice as much dopamine because we don't want to regulate dopamine according to whether we ate a steak. We want to regulate dopamine according to our brain's assessment of the things in life, the assessment of value of the things that could grab our attention or that we could invest energy in. To motivate us. We don't want motivation to go up and down with the consumption of steak. So if you have, uh, if you have a, an influx of methyl groups in the fed state, then you need a way to buffer the excess methyl groups to make sure that you do not uh, over methylate things. And the endogenous buffer of methyl groups is glycine. Glycine takes the methyl group, clears it as methylated glycine metabolites. So in green, we have the GO molecules, the promethylation suppliers of the suppliers of methyl groups, B12, folate, choline, and betaine. And in the red, we have the stop methyl groups, the things that take methyl groups out of the system, and that is glycine. 
that's not to say there aren't other things that can stop up methyl groups, but other things, so for example, a lot of people use niacin to stop up methyl groups. That's kind of using niacin as a drug by forcing the supply of methyl groups to get sucked up into something else. Glycine is the natural endogenous buffer. Its purpose here is to get methylated when there's too many methyl groups and to not get methylated when there's not enough methyl groups. Um, the purpose of niacin or the purpose of anything else that can suck up methyl groups is not to regulate the methyl supply. The purpose of methylating niacin when you get have too much niacin is to get rid of the excess niacin. It's got nothing to do with regulating the methyl groups, right? So this role of glycine is not one that should be listed in a list of many things that can sop up methyl groups. This is a unique and singular role of glycine as the endogenous buffer of excess methyl groups, right? So some people uh, I have to do writings or, or repetitions to remember uh, kind of a joking thing. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. If we we're gonna make a mantra for this slide, it would be glycine is the endogenous buffer of methyl groups. Glycine is the endogenous buffer of methyl groups. Glycine is the endogenous buffer of methyl groups. Okay, so these things impact things that are not mental stuff, but I, I kind of made these slides to focus on the mental effects because I think they're really interesting and underappreciated. Um, and so th this slide focuses on the mental effects. So creatine supports the brain's energy metabolism. And kind of anyone that knows anything about creatine knows that creatine is mostly used to support athletic performance. That's true. Uh, but it's also true that creatine is super important to the brain's energy metabolism. If you have rare genetic defects in creatine synthesis, uh, they cause mainly neurological and then secondarily digestive problems in children. These are very rare defects, but they really illustrate this importance of creatine. So the neurological effects are because creatine supports the brain energy, en brain's energy metabolism. The digestive effects are mainly because creatine is what supplies the enormous amount of energy used to pump stomach acid into the stomach for digestion. But it's also the case that five grams of creatine a day has been shown to, to reduce depression in women. So that really emphasizes the importance of creatine to the brain. Glycine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that has a calming effect and promotes healthy sleep. In addition to that, it also plays many other roles, some in detoxification, and uh, particularly in the synthesis of collagen, which is important to the integrity of all your tissues, but is very rich in the skin and is extremely rich in bone. So healthy bones and skin, especially. Acetylcholine is what you're doing with choline in the brain. It's needed for arousal upon waking. It's used, used for learning and memory and performance on tasks required sustained attention. Boosting acetylcholine levels is especially important to, to uh, mitigating the effects of Alzheimer's disease. Dopamine is often confused as a, uh, as a pleasure chemical. Dopamine is not a pleasure chemical at all, and it's a motivation chemical. It regulate, it, it primarily is a chemical that, that the brain uses to assess value, specifically the value of putting, of devoting energy to a specific task. So in Parkinson's, the dopamine neurons in the parts of the brain that regulate movement degenerate. And you have slow movements, low quality movements, and tremors because the brain is not seeing value in investing energy in producing large movements, well-controlled movements, or in stabilizing muscles and pre thereby preventing tremors. But you also have to invest an enormous amount of energy in your attention. Focusing attention on this presentation requires that dopamine was used to assess value in devoting that attention to this presentation. And that is what the brain uses to determine whether you should invest energy in devoting that attention. Now notice acetylcholine is used for performance on tasks requiring sustained attention. You need dopamine to assess that yes, this thing has value to study then you need acetylcholine to actually study it and get the results of that sustained attention. 
Then histamine, we, I think everyone who knows anything about histamine knows that histamine is responsible for allergic reactions. You take antihistamines for, um, you know, to, Benadryl, for example, for, or Claritin are antihistamines that you take to minimize allergic reactions. But histamine is also used in the stomach as the signal to produce stomach acid, and then creatine is used to use the energy to support the pumping of that stomach acid. Histamine is also important in the brain as a waking signal and as alertness. So you don't want to over <clears throat> overmethylate histamine because if you do, you're not going to have the signal to make stomach acid. Your digestion is going to suffer, and you're going to be you're going to fall asleep in the middle of the day. At the same time, you don't want to undermethylate histamine because if you have too much histamine in the stomach, you're going to get overproduction of stomach acid, which is why, and of course, there's controversy over this, but this is why people are taking PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, antacids, Tums, to quell the effects of excess stomach acid. And in the brain, if you have, you know, you can imagine anxiety as a state of hyper alertness. Um, you know, being alert is is uh, good, but imagine the person who is kind of has their head up and their eyes on something because they're alert to that. Well, if you drew a cartoon character caricature where you exaggerated that trait, the person's got their head way up in the air, their eyes are really wide, and they're looking around at everything. You're going to think that person's a little neurotic, right? Because that state of hyper alertness translates into a state of anxiety, and um, and so that could be generalized anxiety if histamine is high in the brain all the time, or it could be panic attacks if it, the brain, uh, the histamine content of the brain acutely spikes. This is a study where 52 women were diagnosed with major depressive disorder. They were randomized to receive either um, a, a, an SSRI, the, the most common antidepressant, um, or they were randomized to all receive the SSRI either with a placebo or with five grams of creatine per day. And you can see the score on the depression test going down further in the creatine group than it went in the placebo group. And you can see that at between weeks two and eight, it was statistically significant, signified by these um, letters, which means that uh, it was robust enough that we could distinguish it from the effect of chance. And so this is a pretty robust evidence that creatine supplementation has a positive effect on depression. In order to really understand dopamine, we really ha have to understand what's called the tonic and phasic dopamine hypothesis. And this is a model for understanding the effects of dopamine. So as I said before, dopamine should be seen as a chemical that assesses that something you could invest energy or attention in has value. But you perceive that value to the degree to which it exceeds the background level of dopamine. The background level is tonic dopamine. The, the uh, dopamine that is elicited by a thing that could elicit your attention and motivation and energy is phasic pulses of dopamine. I think a good analogy or metaphor for this is to see this as how, you're, how you would view waves against sea level. So tonic dopamine is like sea level. It's stable over time. It forms the background against which phasic pulses of dopamine are red. And it's regulated primarily by uh, catechol O-methyltransferase, or COMT, an enzyme that uses methyl groups to methylate the dopamine. Methylation reduces the level of tonic dopamine, which is analogous to reducing sea level. If you look at a phasic pulse of dopamine, it's like a wave that comes in in an instant. And you can imagine that this wave actually has roots beneath the sea level, but you don't see them. So you don't think of the wave as being whatever the, you know, the movement of underneath the water plus the movement over the water, when you look at the wave, you just see the wave as it rises above the sea level. So your perception of the wave is driven by the degree to which it rises above the background level of water. Similarly, your perception of the value of the thing in your life that elicited a phasic pulse of dopamine is assessed by the degree to which the phasic 
pulse of dopamine exceeds the level of tonic dopamine in the background. A phasic pulse of dopamine lasts hundreds of milliseconds, so way less than one second. It's stimulated by any new stimuli um, that has the potential to grab your attention and motivation basically has the potential to uh, elicit some phasic dopamine response. Um, so your brain is basically assessing the value of it. If, you, if it gets enough stimulation, it will cause dopamine to spike. But whether that dopamine spike means anything to the brain depends on whether the brain perceives it as big enough rising above the level of tonic dopamine. Phasic dopamine pulses are important for updating, resetting, or gaining, gating neural responses to novel information. Um, and this is, re and they're regulated primarily by up reuptake to transporters and not through methylation. So therefore, methylation, even though it degrades dopamine, it does not reduce the power of a dopamine pulse. It increases the power of a dopamine pulse because it reduces the background noise and makes that phasic pulse more visible, more perceptible to the brain. So when the level of tonic dopamine is low because methylation is higher, your phasic pulses of dopamine appear large and your motivation and attention are easier to win. When the tonic level of dopamine is high, that wave looks smaller. The phasic pulse appears small to the brain and your motivation and attention are harder to win. As a result, if you have the right balance between tonic and phasic dopamine, because you have the right balance between methylation, you know, methylation of dopamine, uh, or the right amount of met methylate, the Goldilocks amount of methylation of dopamine, you'll have a balance between stability and flexibility of your mind, which promotes mental health. If you have too much phasic dopamine relative to tonic dopamine, and that's because you had too much methylation that degraded the tonic dopamine pool, making it smaller, making the phasic pulses appear bigger, you will your motivation and attention will be too easy to win. You will have instability in your mind, hyper arousal and distractibility. If you don't have enough methylation and you have too much tonic dopamine, too much background noise, too much sea level, you will not perceive the phasic dopamine pulse as having as meaningful um, a, a, as a rise above the background noise. And you will therefore have a pathological level of inflexibility. You have, uh, ment you have too much mental stability. In other words, you'll be mentally unflexible and this can form brittle mental states. So the instability we can think of as like rumination, right? In, you, you, when you complain about, you know, I'm ruminating on this thing, um, you can say that in a negative context when you mean this, this thing I don't want to be in my mind is stuck there. Um, and that's bad. Uh, but that same, that same mental stability is also what you use to focus on things, right? So being able to focus on this presentation, being able to focus on your other studies is a very important positive trait. We want mental stability. It's just we want, to, we want enough flexibility to let go of the things that we don't want in our brain, enough stability to hold on to the things that we do want in our brain. If, if we um, have a pathological level of mental stability or inflexibility, we have no control over that. We'll, if like maybe by chance we're focusing on what we want to, but as soon as a depression or anxiety producing thought, thought pattern or feeling enters our mind, it's stuck there. And that's what we don't want. Brittle mental states is sort of like, you can imagine like, imagine a potter who moistens clay so that it becomes soft and malleable and can turn it into something beautiful. If that clay then dries and the potter tries to modify it with his hands or her hands before that clay is baked, it's brittle. It just kind of falls apart real easily. So you can imagine some of the brittle mental state, they don't transition well between different mental states. And that's really bad socially. So, you know, socially, like if, if you and someone else, if like two people are starting to annoy each other socially, um, the annoying person starts to see signals of that on the person's face because that person is easing into an annoyed state. And then that person sees those signs and then says, maybe I should back off of this thing. 
or you know, if you say something that makes someone upset and you can see in their face that it made them upset, then you can be like, oh, I didn't realize I was making you upset, I'm sorry. But if a person has no transition, then the annoying or upsetting person has no social clues that the person is becoming upset until all of a sudden that person breaks and immediately transitions into a mental state of complete fury. Um, and so that, you know, whether it's you, you're ruminating on something that was depressing or you transition so quickly when you get angry or depressed or whatever that you can't give off any social clues, these things are all, are all pathological things that we want to try to minimize. Uh, okay, this is a study where they took uh, people by different um, COMT genotypes. So some people have uh, fast COMT, which has high methylation. Some people have slow COMT, which has low methylation of dopamine, and some people are intermediate. And they gave these pictures, uh, these people pictures that were emotionally negative and or were perceived as unpleasant. And then they measured the degree to which their amygdala in their brain lit up. And the amygdala is the seat of emotional processing in the brain. So when these people were given um, the unpleasant pictures, only the people with low methylation phenotype, because of the slow COMT genotype, uh, had only they had the amygdala light up. And you know, how do we reconcile this to, um, to what we were saying before? Well, the people who, who, don't, who aren't able to methylate dopamine well are too mentally stable. So they see the picture, they can't get rid of the picture. So the picture doesn't just come into the brain and leave. It comes into the brain that stays there until it elicits an emotional response. In the people with the faster COMT, who have better methylation of dopamine, they have more mental flexibility, you see the picture and they're like, you know what, I don't like that picture, I'm not gonna think about it anymore. And the picture leaves. And so it's this, it's not the, it's not the, it's not the trigger, it's that the trigger came in and stayed there that produced the emotional response in the low methylation phenotype. Now they also looked at the degree to which the frontal cortex where, which is the seat of, of decision-making and executive function and to some degree willpower, like you're sort of invest, you can invest energy with, you know, I think that I don't want to feel this way, therefore I will not feel that way. You're really taking energy out of that thinking part of your brain in the front of your skull. And what they're looking here is the degree to which people were lighting up their, um, the degree to which the, the people were lighting up their prefrontal cortex in response to the emotional impact of that unpleasant picture. And that prefrontal cortical activity was really happening in the low methylation phenotype. And what that means is these people were investing um, thought energy to try to control their emotions. And you can imagine that's really exhausting, right? So like these people over here that with the high methylation phenotype, um, they had the benefit of being very mentally flexible. The picture goes into their mind. They don't like the picture. They stop thinking about it. They don't have their emotions light up and they don't need to invest any extra energy in their decision-making willpower part of the brain to try to control their emotions. These people are getting exhausted because they see the picture, they can't get it out of their head, they are stuck on it, the emotions light up, and then they're expending all this extra energy with their thoughts, trying to control their emotions. So to some degree, this is, a, this is you know, there's genetic influences that lead to personality traits. We're not, we don't wanna demonize one or the other phenotype because actually these high, CO, high methylation, fast COMT uh, genotypes, they're too mentally flexible sometimes. Like they're not as good at schoolwork as these low methylation people are. So it's a trade-off. It's not a value judgment. But to we don't want to we don't want to be at the extremes where we're losing control. We want to be kind of towards the middle. So yeah, we we maybe we, it's good to have variation in the personality, but we don't want that variation in the personality to be tipped off the edge by bad nutrition 
to the point where we become pathologically mentally stable or pathologically mentally flexible. This is an abstract where I'll just highlight that this antihistamine was equivalent to um, these, uh, these other drugs that are affecting serotonin and GABA activity and controlling anxiety. Um, you know, however, it caused more sleepiness and drowsiness. That's just emphasizing the importance of histamine to promoting anxiety in the brain, as I mentioned before. And this study, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I, I just want to mention this really interesting uh, study. Very, we have an N of three here, so it's sort of anecdotal. Uh, but this was uh, what they were doing was they were trying to try a low histamine diet to control uh, itching and other skin problems, and it it didn't work. Um, but 100% of subjects who reported panic attacks as one of their additional problems, which was three of the people, reported complete remission of this symptom. <laughs> so it's this is sort of like anecdotal evidence supporting what this um, analysis of many studies was saying, which is that histamine in the brain, if you cannot control it properly through methylation, is pro-anxiety, um, pro pro-panic attack. Uh, you know, again, we want balance though, right? Like uh, this antihistamine, just like Benadryl is associated with sleepiness and drowsiness. We need enough histamine in the brain for alertness and um, alert, alertness and wakefulness. Uh, th this is emphasizing some of the importance of acetylcholine to the brain. So th this is describing some rats where the animals were fed three times the normal amount of choline thought to be essential um, by by these was uh, I think it was rats or yeah rats um, and so you know we thought rats need x amount of choline give them three times more than that while they're pregnant and the rat pups have lifelong 30 percent increase in visual spatial and auditory memory they have a complete elimination of age-related senility they're protected against neurotoxins they're better at multitasking and they have lower rate of interference memory which is the type of memory problem that makes you forget where you parked your car when you visit the same grocery store uh, 300 times in your life because you're confusing the different times. In humans, we know that um, alpha GPC, which is a form of choline that is 10 times more effective at boosting acetylcholine than other forms of choline, uh, 1200 milligrams per day showed through seven different indices of cognitive function to have a very strong improvement of Alzheimer's type dementia compared to a placebo control. And so that's very similar to how the rat pups, when they're fed, when their mothers are fed high choline diets during pregnancy, are, uh, you know, have an elimination of age-related senility. So it's similar across animals and humans. These are some studies on glycine. So uh, in schizophrenics, 60 grams of glycine a day has been used successfully to reduce the, uh, as effect, essentially as an antipsychotic to reduce schizophrenic symptoms. And in people with sleeping trouble, three grams of glycine before bed improves sleep quality and also improves, uh, it, it improves both the degree to which you fall asleep quickly and also improves the quality of sleep. So even if, in the people who didn't have insomnia, the, they felt more rested when they got up from the same amount of sleep because they had more deep sleep. So if we think about nourishing the methylation system, we're talking about getting, um, and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna speed through these slides a little bit to, to, to get to the basic principles, and then, so we have more time for questions at the end. Um, but we need methionine for, um, you know, as the donor of, of all of the, of this methionine is what becomes s methionine. So if, Animal foods are twice as rich as, as plant foods in methionine, but if you just eat enough protein, so half a gram to a gram of protein per pound of body weight, even on a vegan diet, if you, it's hard to get that much protein on a vegan diet, but plant proteins are adequate in methionine if you get enough total protein. Um, if you don't eat enough total protein, that's probably where you would see a major benefit from consuming animal protein versus plant protein. Of course, that's complicated by the fact that animal protein has other nutrients like B12, and choline uh, that are also important to this system. 
Magnesium, the best way to, cons to get enough magnesium is to consume a large volume of unrefined plant foods, including whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, and vegetables. Um, mineral water, especially Gerolsteiner, is a great source of magnesium. It is possible to get enough magnesium on an animal, uh, mostly animal diet. It's just a little harder. Um, and then for the energy to produce acetonazole methionine, we need adequate calories, healthy body composition, insulin, and insulin sensitivity, good thyroid health, um, and all the nutrients involved in energy metabolism, which is many of them, Six, you know, seven B vitamins, a uh, bunch of minerals, especially iron, copper, sulfur, uh, is very many nutrients involved in energy metabolism that are added on to all the methylation nutrients. Um, there's not really good evidence for tying genetics to the first step, uh, the methionine adenosyl transferase reaction. There are some variations, but no one has really shown what they do. Um, you know, but uh, if you appear to have a problem with that reaction, you can supplement with SAMe to bypass it. And then also, if you supplement with three to five grams of creatine per day, which you can also get from one to two pounds of meat, um, you can reduce the demand for it, right? If 45% if of your methylation is to, is to uh, synthesize creatine, then you can greatly reduce the need for methylation. You can almost cut it in half by getting enough creatine. Um, we also want to support the recycling of homocysteine to methionine with folate. And um, we can do that with two to three servings of liver, legumes, or leafy greens per day. You really shouldn't eat more than two servings of liver per day, so you're very dependent on legumes and leafy greens and getting adequate folate. Uh, there's some data that four-day sprouted legumes have three to six times more folate than unsprouted legumes. Um, that would suggest that you could greatly reduce the amount of legumes that you need to eat to get enough folate, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, the data is not that uh, rigorous yet, so I, I, I don't want to say that you shouldn't try to hit the target of two or three servings of liver, legumes, and leafy greens per day because of that, but certainly a good way to supercharge your folate status would be to eat sprouted legumes. And then there's some very uh, loose data suggesting that eggs from chickens raised on pasture are so high in folate that you could use just two eggs per day to meet the folate requirement. Again, the data is not that strong there, so I don't want to say that you should do that instead of eating two to three servings of liver, legumes, or leafy greens, but again, eating pastured egg yolks is a great way to supercharge your folate. Folate is not stable in the freezer except in liver. Um, so frozen vegetables are not a reliable source of folate. Frozen liver is a reliable source of folate. To get enough B12, um, we, can meet, uh, we can meet the B12 requirement in a few different ways. So 48 grams of liver per day would do it. Three and a half, uh, three, three and a half ounce servings of meat per day would do it. Notice that if you get your B12 for meat, you have to eat a lot. Eight grams of oysters or clams would do it. Notice that, you know, if you're getting it from liver or oysters or clams, you don't have to eat that much at all. Three eight-ounce glasses of milk or three three-and-a-half-ounce servings of cheese per day will do it. Notice, if you get it from meat or milk or cheese, you have to eat a lot of those foods. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't think they're at risk because they're not vegan, but they're eating, you know, three ounces of meat a day. That's not going to give you enough B12. There's some data suggesting that green or purple nori are equivalent to oysters and clams as vegan foods, and that black trumpet, chanterelle, or shiitake mushrooms are equivalent to meat in terms of the servings you need. I, um, I still think that vegans should not rely entirely on those foods and should be very proactive on monitoring B12 status because we only have a few studies indicating this. All other edible bacteria, any yeast, any other mushrooms are not good sources of B12. Um, Digestive concerns. You can only absorb a day's worth of B12 every four to five hours. So you cannot, for example, eat 10 ounces of liver in one meal on the weekend and have that cover your, your B12 for the week. Um, but you can eat eight, ounce of, eight grams of liver at one meal and have it cover your needs of B12 for the day. In fact, you can eat eight grams of liver at every meal 
and you can get two you can get two extra days worth of B12 every day. In other words, if you ate if you if you ate eight grams of liver or oysters or clams at every at each of three meals a day, after a year you'd have three years stored up, or you have two extra years of B12 stored up. After two years, you'd have four extra years of B12 stored up. After three years, you'd have six extra years of B12 stored up. And you can probably reach that way a 30-year supply of B12. Why is that important? Well, half of people are, in, are infected with, um, with H. pylori, and there's controversy over whether that's an intrinsically bad thing or not, but it, it causes some inflammation in the stomach. And it gets worse and worse and worse starting in childhood to the point where by the time someone's age 65, they basically have, if they have H. pylori, they basically have like a 30% chance, almost, like maybe 25% chance or something, of becoming B12 deficient because of poor absorption. Uh, there's also a much rarer autoimmune condition called pernicious anemia that affects 1% or 2% of the elderly um, and, and a much smaller percentage of people under the age of 65. Um, but you imagine you become vegan or you become to the point where the, this, this stomach inflammation or pernicious anemia hits you. If you had a 30-year supply of B12, you could go a very long time without any problem. In fact, by the time you're 65, 30 years is going to take you to 95. So it, you know, and imagine the difference between a very nutrient-dense diet that's getting a day's worth of B12 at every meal and from childhood is saving up a 30-year supply of B12. Imagine the difference between that person and the person who just got enough when they be, when, when by the time they're 65, they have a 30% chance of having enough gastritis to not absorb B12. That is a massive difference in the ability to go all the way through old age with very good B12 status. All right, so the other side of the methylation support is choline. And I listed here on the slides, we'll distribute the slides, so I don't want to read through everything just for the sake of time here. But basically, these are some of the best ways to get an egg yolk's worth of choline. And these are some of the best ways to get the equivalent to that in betaine. Because you can't make acetylcholine from betaine, but you can support methylation, I don't want to say get all of your choline requirement as betaine, but I think it's, I think it's legit to get up to half of your choline as betaine. Um, so in other words, mix and match any four per day of things on the left, and you can substitute up to two of those four things with any of the things on the right. And I'll give you a, a resource um, to get into that uh, at the end where I, I have a database of these things as well. I'm gonna go through these a little more quickly, but the uh, gist of these slides is that if you eat a steak and you have too much methionine, you want to get rid of the excess. And as we said before, you would buffer the excess with glycine. You'll also turn on this enzyme cystathionine beta synthase or CBS, which uses vitamin B6 uh, and glycine or serine to get rid of the excess homocysteine. Um, so, and then you also will shut off the enzymes that recycle homocysteine and methionine. So in the fed state, you're not using these enzymes. You're using them in the fasting state to recycle homocysteine. The fed state, you're just using methionine for methylation reactions and get, getting rid of the homocysteine. Now, the signal to control that, um, the signal to control that is, is methylfolate. And it's uh, very important to understanding the impact of methylfolate levels on glycine status. And so I'm going to go into that here. So when SAMe is low, right, because you're in the fasting state um, and you don't have the state coming in, your remember SAMe is what is going to shut down MTHFR in the fed state. So this is not happening in the, fed, the fasting state. So MTHFR is very active in the fasting state when SAMe, uh, excuse me, when SAMe is low. In um, and in that state, excuse me, sorry. So methylfolate is used as the signal to control the methylation of glycine. Remember, glycine is what you absorb extra methyl groups when you have too many of them. Because methylfolate levels are high when CME is low, 
that methylfolate will say, SAMI is low. Don't methylate glycine. You want to conserve methyl groups. When SAMI is high, it shuts down MTHFR because it doesn't want to use MTHFR to recycle homocysteine to methionine. That also allows methylfolate levels to drop in the fed state when SAMI is high. And that dropping of methylfolate acts as a signal to turn on the buffering of extra methyl groups with glycine. So the, um, the take home point here is that when everything is working well, we buffer extra methyl groups with glycine. But the signal we use to do that is methylfolate. So if we have something that interferes with our ability to make methylfolate, that will falsely act as a signal that SAMI levels, um, that's, that SAMI levels are high, that glycine should be methylated, and that we should be removing methyl groups to put them into the urine as methylated glycine metabolites. In other words, if something impairs our ability to make methylfolate, we have a false signal to turn on the methylation of glycine, which causes us to lose both methyl groups and glycine in the urine. All right, if we look at where we get glycine, it's mainly found in skin and bones. This is comparing chicken skin and chicken bones to chicken breast and to tofu. Um, not much difference in the animal and plant foods, but huge difference where collagen-rich tissues are in proportion to their collagen, very rich in glycine. The famous MTHFR polymorphism is a polymorphism that decreases MTHFR activity. And there's a lot of people going around saying, I have MTHFR. Well, not only do all of us have MTHFR, the enzyme, but most of us have, <clears throat> most of us have at least one copy of one of the two major polymorphisms that lowers MTHFR activity. These polymorphisms are A1298C, which is less severe, and C677T, which is more severe. And only about 15% of us have neither of them, which is full activity. We can have one copy of the weak one, one copy of the strong one, two copies of the weak one, one copy of each, or two copies of the strong one. And what we have is six different categories of people that have a graded decrease of MTHFR activity through the population. 17% drop, 33% drop, 39% drop, 53% drop, 75% drop. It's not exactly equally distributed, but it's fairly evenly distributed across the population. 15% have full activity, 9% are the worst. Most people are somewhere in between, fairly evenly spread. So the nutritional implications of this are that as you approach a 75% reduction in MTHFR activity, which is the effect of the strongest one, the need for choline is doubled. Why? Because when you don't have enough methyl folate, you rely more on choline as an alternative methyl donor. Glycine is wasted as methylated metabolites, much of which leave the body in the urine. This also wastes methyl groups. Why? Because methyl folate is the signal that you don't have enough methyl groups. Um, or excuse me, this the signal that you have too many methyl groups and causes glycine to get wasted in the urine when you have too many methyl groups. So if you have an inability to make methylfolate, um, your body is going to always think you have too many methyl groups and always pee out glycine as methylated metabolites, even when it shouldn't be, which is going to cause loss of methyl groups and loss of glycine. And if you don't nutritionally meet your needs for if you have MTHFR polymorphisms, then at that point is when you'll have regulation of dopamine, elimination of histamine, and synthesis of creatine being compromised. Now, there's some data indicating that 1.6 milligrams of riboflavin, vitamin B2, over and on top of the, require, the general requirement, which is 1.3 milligrams, bring the total to about three milligrams. I say at least three because there's other things that can increase your riboflavin requirement. So about three or more milligrams of riboflavin may abolish the effect of these polymorphisms. And the data is mostly in the C677T. I don't know about A1298C. Um, but, but in other words, the reason is these things lower MTHFR activity because MTHFR needs to use vitamin B2 to play its role in folate metabolism. And, if, and these polymorphisms decrease the binding 
of the riboflavin to the enzyme and make it less effective. But it's only less effective if you don't compensate for that polymorphism with extra riboflavin. So it's possible, so it's certainly the case that these nutritional implications will be mitigated by supplying at least three milligrams a day of riboflavin. It's possible that they will be eliminated. We don't have enough research to say if it fully, you know, fully gets rid of these problems or only partly does. So my recommendations if you have low MTHFR activity would be to the extent it approaches that 75% decrease, get 900 to 1200 milligrams of choline per, per day. Um, this is supplying the alternative methyl donor. Meet the basic folate requirement from food and supplement with up to 400 micrograms per day of methyl folate. The purpose of this methyl folate is we want to have, and I would say spread this as evenly as possible across your meals. What you want is this slow, steady drip of methyl folate to make sure that there's always some there to, to, control, to shut off the glycine buffering system because you don't want it in overdrive. Eat one to two pounds of meat per day to meet your creatine requirement. However, you should be, you should be conservative about this because if you have not fixed the excess buffering of glycine, more methionine coming in from the meat will cause SAMe levels to go up, which will cause you to lose even more glycine. So you have to be very careful about this one to two pounds of meat approach of getting the creatine, because if you don't supply enough glycine to compensate, you could worsen the effect on glycine. So a, an arguably safer thing to do is to supplement with three to five grams per day of creatine monohydrate. Get adequate protein, but not too much. Consume skin and bones. Consider supplementing with gelatin or hydrolyzed collagen. Um, I have vital proteins, marine collagen here. Uh, Great Lakes and Thrive are also good, good sources. And then be careful with SAMe. Right? SAMe is great if you're trying to bypass the methionine and adenosyl transferase reaction. But if you have an MTHFR polymorphism, that SAMe could be really powerful in worsening the wasting of glycine. Um, so, you know, be extremely careful and conservative with supplementing with SAMe. Um, in general, I would say you, good ways to individualize this to your needs, or if, you, if, you, if you're coaching or uh, clients or you have patients to individualize your approach to them, characterize methylation genetics, use symptoms to understand when certain nutrients may be more necessary. For example, distractibility or insomnia may imply a need for more glycine. Anxiety or negative thoughts, getting stuck in the mind might imply more methyl donors needed. Memory or cognitive performance might emphasize the need for choline, especially alpha-GPC if you're using supplements. Helpful lab tests are plasma amino acids, so look at methionine, glycine, sarcosine, which is a methylated glycine metabolite and homocysteine. Plasma and serum folate, um, not RBC alone, although doing both together can be very helpful. That's because plasma and serum folate reflect methylated folate. RBC folate re reflects total folate. Um, actually, I, I, I will revoke my recommendation for the HDRI methylation panel. I'm not using it anymore. I forgot to update that part of the slide. Um, and the Quest has a serum creatine or urinary creatine biosynthesis disorders panel. The reference ranges will not be useful, but in theory, you could track changes over time in your, in your ability to synthesize creatine with it. Uh, additional resources that would be valuable are um, my choline calculator, where you know I mentioned strategine in one of those slides to use for, for uh, genetics in this pathway. Strategine is a great way to get a more expansive view of what I consider the best genetics, but I actually analyze four or five, um, four, four uh, methylation genetics and a choline-related gene for free in my choline calculator at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash choline calculator, which then gives you an output that tells you how many egg yolk equivalents to, uh, to eat and then links to my choline database where you can see literally every food expressed as choline equivalents and even breaking down the subtypes of different forms of choline and betaine in those foods. Then chrismasterjohnphd.com slash methylation has both an introduction to methylation in written form as well as a protocol for dealing with it. chrismasterjohnphd.com slash 101 is my free 30-day vitamins and minerals 101 course that co covers this kind of thing. Um, in a much less technical and much more simple and practical way in the context of all the nutrients. 
And then chrismasterjohnph.com slash cheat sheet is where you can buy my testing nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet, which looks at the, at the practical use of those blood and urine tests that can relate to methylation in the context of all the testing that you would want to do for vitamins, minerals, and essential fatty acids. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. I went a little longer than I was expecting to, so let's do 10 or 15 minutes of questions. Okay, we can do that. Chris, thank you so much. You're and um, beautiful biochemistry lesson. Anybody who thinks biochemistry isn't important now, go back to your books. <laughs> right? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, let's get, and, and I'll, I'll say, Chris's website is so informative. When I opened the store and I said he has tons of free information available, not just information, it's valuable information. And the cheat sheet is simply brilliant. I've had it for quite some time and refer to it often. So heads up Thank on you. that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Back on um, B vitamins, the question if they're water soluble like the rest of the B vitamins and where is B12 stored in the body? Is what water soluble? B12. Oh, uh, yeah, B12 is, is mostly water soluble, but it sort of like doesn't matter because the, um, the mechanisms by which you absorb it are largely independent of all the other water and fat soluble um, by nutrients and it's it has its own absorption pathway um, so it it just the water solubility versus fat solubility really doesn't matter mm -hmm. in terms of nutrient absorption and whether you should have fat in the diet or whether you should take it with a meal or not um, and then where is it stored in the body was the other question Yes. The highest stores of, so in general, it's stored wherever it's used. There's not, um, there's a, but there's the, the extra is, is uh, mainly store. When I talked about like eating over and above the requirement, mm -hmm. um, that's mainly stored in the liver slash mm -hmm. continually recirculated in the bile. Right. Great. And um, when you were talking about uh, magnesium and sources, you had listed a mineral water, but we didn't get the name on that. Yeah, Gerolsteiner. It's Say the it again? highest. Gerolsteiner, G E R O L S T E I N E R. It's the highest one in magnesium. Okay, thank you. Um, just a comment about um, um, adequate B12 from. <laughs> from um from food and it's a lot of it's a lot of animal products it's a lot of meat it's a lot of dairy um it's a lot of liver question is who eats that much liver <laughs> so it's it's whether it's a lot really depends on your approach right mm -hmm. so it, it's it's interesting to me that um t colin campbell the china study guy who's pro vegan right. he right. taught he argues that you should that you really should eat, restrict your animal products to two percent of your diet which I think is totally bogus. Um, and he then argues that you should just eat 0% animal products because that's easier than eating 2%. <laughs> but actually, but actually 2% animal products, if all of it is liver, uh, liver, oysters, and clams, would actually go an enormous way to meeting your nutrient needs. Right. And for optimal B12 intake, you know, you you get you're in a much better position if you're rotating eight grams of liver oysters or clams at each meal which is almost none of the meal versus consuming a hundred grams of meat or fish or dairy products at every meal um you know you're, it's literally less than 10 percent uh so you need very high volumes if you're using very mediocre nutrient density animal products uh, but you can get away with a lot less amount of animal products if you focus on intensive nutrient density. You know, I'm aware in, in studies they don't uh, often distinguish between the sources and the where the proteins are accessed from. But do you think that quality of the protein matters? Does it matter about grass-fed, pasture, organic versus feedlot? Uh, it depends depends on the nutrient so i'm not sure off the top of my head yeah so uh there's so actually um there i don't think this is well studied but 
grain feeding generally has a negative effect on the rumen that can actually lead to a lot of negative microbiome things that actually will create B12, or not just B12, create a, a variety of antagonists to B vitamins rather than synthesis of B vitamins. So like B12 winds up in liver or meat or milk because the animal's taking cobalt from the soil um, you know, or from the, from the grass that took it from the soil. And then microorganisms are in the rumen are synthesizing B12. And um, grain feeding can, I, I don't think it's studied well, but it, I've seen it studied in the sense of like what causes animals to get sick, which I mostly studied when I was trying, when I was teaching vitamins and minerals to veterinary students. Mm -hmm. And so um, animals can get B vitamin deficiencies from grain feeding because of um, the negative effects on the microbiome in the rumen. Mm -hmm. And then of course, cobalt deficient soils, you, the microorganisms can't synthesize any B12, so that could impact it. Um, and then, you know, quality makes a difference elsewhere. So probably folate is much higher in the liver of a grass-fed animal because what are the other two sources of folate? Legumes and leafy greens, grass is leafy green, grains are poor in folate. So an animal is going to have much higher folate intakes, but I haven't seen the folate content of liver uh, analyzed from the different animals. Okay. But yeah, generally grass feeding is better. You would think. Um, histamine question. Um, when it's in excess, if someone is experiencing anxiety routinely and increasingly, not necessarily panic attack, but including panic attacks, um, should histamine, would you consider histamine should always be tested in that, in that situation? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, I don't think it could hurt to test histamine, but the histamine in your blood is not necessarily going to reflect the histamine in your brain. Mm -hmm. So it could be, I mean, it, you could sort of surmise that if your whole blood histamine is high, that your brain histamine might be high, but you can't really say that definitively. Um, although uh, histamine in increases the, like most histamine in the brain is made in the brain, um, but histamine in the circulation does increase the permeability of the blood brain barrier. So it's probably the case that high levels of histamine in your blood will result in some increase in histamine in your brain. I just don't know if, if it's gonna, how, how well they would correlate. Thank you. Um, questions back to glycine. Just a second. Um, yeah, this attendee was um, heard your glycine podcast recently um, re uh, relating to methylation. Yep. And so from her takeaway from that was that someone can supplement with glycine in place of methylfolate and B12 for a better response. Was that, did she understand that correctly? No, so uh, folate and B12 are pro or methyl suppliers. Glycine is a methyl subtractor, um, so they're really playing independent roles. Um, I'm not sure which podcast she was talking about because I've done a, no a number on different um, on, on different angles of this. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I did say is that if you have low methylfolate levels you will lose glycine and you will have to compensate for it. Mm -hmm. But getting more glycine is not really sparing to folate. It is just compensating for a negative effect of having low methylfolate levels. Thank you. And then follow up on that is, um, does someone with MTHFR677 plus plus want to use glycine then instead um, since they're lower in methylation? I think this person might be confusing glycine with choline. So uh, in which case, if we reread the previous question and substituted the word choline for glycine, that would make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so choline is an alternative methyl donor to cho choline slash bedine, which is also known as trimethylglycine or TMG. Mm -hmm. That's an alternative methyl donor to folate and B12. Um, 
And so, yes, to some degree, you can compensate for it. You don't want to completely compensate for it because there are some tissues that aren't good at using choline slash betaine. Um, but you can largely compensate for it. Then can you reread this last question? I forgot what it was. Uh, and and some does, someone, yeah, does someone with MTHFR 677 plus want to use glycine then? Oh, and, oh yeah. Is there so, lower in methylation? Right, right, right. So, um, so if we... If I answer that as if they were asking about choline, mm -hmm. uh, the answer is sort of yes. So if you go back and look at my my bullet point protocol, or you go to this uh, Chris Master on PhD.com slash methylation page, um, it, the choline requirement is doubled because of that. Uh, but you don't want to avoid um, you don't you don't want to completely replace it because, for example, methylfolate is irreplaceable as the thing that as the off switch for the glycine buffer system so there's no way to shut that off without methylfolate so the idea is you want to get methylfolate in there and you want to conserve it by reducing the demand for it with creatine and by increasing the alternative supply with choline and you just sort of assume that it's not going to continually get recycled because you're not good at making methylfolate um, so that's why you want to spread it out across meals. You're sort of like putting some in there at one meal and you're assuming it's not going to be there by the next time you eat. Um, so you don't want to substitute one versus the other. You want to attack all angles. Thank you. Um, asking if you can address the issues with methylation and how to appropriately dose by types of folate and B12. Um, Chip provides an example. If someone is plus minus COMT with MTHFR 677 plus, should they alternate the methyl groups in order to not do too much and cause overmethylation issues? So first of all, if they're plus minus COMT, they're completely normal. The plus minus CO, and that is a little pet peeve of mine. A lot of the third party in reports that use um, 23andMe data show you when the yellow zone as if you're like part way towards the red zone, but actually, 50% of people are plus minus, 25% are plus plus, and 25% are minus minus. Mm -hmm. um, so plus minus COMT is literally as normal as you could get and doesn't impact us at all. Mm -hmm. Then you have the MTHFR C677T. Um, you're, I mean, first of all, you shouldn't be that concerned with overmethylation if your glycine status is good. Um, Glycine is the endogenous buffer of overmethylation. You shouldn't be overmethylating anything if you have glycine in place. The one exception is if you trans, if you if you sort of were in a very bad space methylation-wise, and then all of a sudden you fix everything at once, you might go through like a two or three week period where you are overmethylating things. That has nothing to do with needing to modify the forms of different supplements. It's more about how you should ease into the protocol rather than going from two radically different places. Just because if your body is conditioned to being in a low methyl group supply state, it's probably going to ramp up the enzymes to try to 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 um, you know increase their activity. It's sort of like if your TV show was, or if this podcast, if I was talking so quiet you couldn't hear me, and you turned your volume all the way up, and then all of a sudden I started yelling, you would get ear damage from it. It's kind of like that. That the the solution of that is just to ease into the protocol if you're in a if you're going from a very bad diet to a very good protocol, and then um, the different forms are they're not as relevant as people think they are. So, um, you know, a, a folate molecule gets recycled from full unmethylated folate to methylated folate eighteen thousand times a day uh, from your amino acid supply. So you know you you eat methyl folate or you eat formal folate, folic acid, um, folic acid or whatever like it gets metabolized once where it's relevant to the thing that you put in your body and then it just sort of enters the same pool. Um, so with methyl, with MTHFR, you're specifically bad at making methylfolate. So you do want to supply methylfolate specifically, but the methyl group on that folate molecule is not that significant as a methyl group supply. Um, because again, that folate molecule in a, in a healthy everything working optimally situation, literally like 17,999 methyl groups that did not, that weren't on that methyl group when you ate them would be added to it that day. So methyl group of that methyl folate is not that significant for a methyl group supply and for overmethylation. 
it's significant because methylfolate, which you're not good at making, so you need to take in in the diet, is the off switch for the glycine buffer system. Full stop. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, it's so I'm going to ask a follow-up question on this, and then um, we'll bring the Q&A to a close. So what would be a healthy dose of supplementing? Because it seems there's some really high amounts of methylfolate and B12 recommendations out there. Um, you're asking for folate in B12? Mm -hmm. Okay, so for B12, high doses are often necessary to combat absorption issues. So probably no one on the face of the earth needs B12 injections. Um, and it also all the evidence indicates that you can overcome absorption defects with oral B12 at roughly a thousand times the normal amounts of B12. Um, and there, and the absorption is pretty low, uh, and there's not even really many good hypothetical arguments for why that would be uh, harmful. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I mean, mo like most people don't need to be supplementing with B12 if they're eating well, according to what I was saying. Yeah. But then, if they have subclinical gastritis or pernicious anemia, they need to be supplementing no matter what they're eating. You know, so it's really like a binary thing where, you, where like, if your absorption is healthy, eat good foods, and if it's not, you probably need a high dose supplement. And there's almost no argument for a low dose supplement, really. Like, I mean, I guess as an like, if you don't want to eat, if if you eat um, a sort of like low animal product, plant based diet, and you don't like the food sources that I put up there. I guess you could argue that you want to supplement with like three to five micrograms of B12 a day. Um, but for the most part, that, that's not that relevant. For folate, I think it's more relevant. Um, there's not, you know, there's not well characterized toxicity for folate, but there are, there are um, some indications that it can not only mask a B12 deficiency, but it can also, in a B12 deficient person, be the thing that precipitates the neurological dysfunction. Uh, and there are also some people who have hypersensitivity to folate, but we also sort of have no idea what happens to folate when you consume it at grams per day. And there's no, or, or grams per day, even milligrams per day. And there's like no reason for anyone to be taking high doses of folate. It just doesn't make any sense in almost any context. And this methylation stuff, you can't ever under any circumstance make up for the fact that, um, you know, like if if uh, the typical folate molecules is recycled 18,000 times a day and you have a really big hit at, at your MTHFR and so you lose 13,000 out of those 18,000 re recycling events, you're not going to take 13,000 times the RDA for folate. No one does that. Um, so thinking that taking 100 times the folate is going to compensate for the methyl groups by taking 100 times the amount of methyl folate doesn't make any sense at all because you're actually missing out on 13,000 times, not 100 times. Um, so there's just, no, there's not really any rationale for taking high dose folate. Um, so I think 400 micrograms dietary folate equivalents of methyl folate is the good general dose. And I, I'm okay with increasing that to like a milligram in some people, but most of the time, no. Okay. All right. Yet we're seeing products that are coming out with higher and higher amounts, specific, you know, specifically following all the um, genetic testing that's being done now. So appreciate the caution and the um, good response to that question. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the wonderful presentation and very engaging Q&A. Good questions, good responses here. So since it was so good, I want to remind you that it was recorded and it's going to be available on Hawthorne's website under archived webinars in just a few days. And there will be a survey to fill out as soon as this webinar closes. It always helps us to have your feedback and any comments about this presentation. So I really appreciate you taking the time for that. And I want to thank you again, um, Chris, for just a fabulous presentation and taking the time and spending it with Hawthorne today. You're welcome. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, it's a return visit, and I and I really appreciate that. I also want to give a big hat tip to James Bernardinelli for engineering all our webinars and keeping everything flowing so smoothly. And with that, 
I'm going to conclude today's presentation. I want to thank everybody for sharing in this educational experience with us. As always, I wish you all the best of health, and I look forward to learning more together as we continue at Hawthorne University. Take care, everybody.